Shear and bending moment diagrams are useful because they tell us that what the maximum internal loads are. We want to know what the biggest internal shear is and the biggest internal bending moment is because that tells us where and whether or not a beam is going to break. We'd like to be able to do this by graphical construction so that we can do it as fast and easily as we can because as you remember, the internal loads are going to change every time you have a different loading condition. So if we've got a beam that we're building, we need to figure out how to figure out how to find out the internal loads quickly and easily. We're going to develop these rules so that we can just sketch V and X and M and X. We're going to look at them, look at the loadings, and be able to do with a few calculations what we had to do with a whole bunch of free body diagrams and equations of equilibrium before. So we'll look at the guiding principles. The general idea here is that we're going to find out where our loads start at X, where our internal loads V and M start at X equals zero. So what's happening at the left hand side of our, our beam? And then if we can march along the beam and say how V and M are going to change as we go along, we can sketch that whole graph. And then you got to remember to check the values at the end, because wherever your graph ends up, that needs to be at V of L and M of L. So our guiding principle here is that the change in the shear diagram, remember we're going to start at O and then we're going to see how it changes as we go along, is the area under the load intensity diagram. So if I have some distributed load pressing down on my beam, the area under that diagram is going to tell me how much V changes. If there isn't any, then V is not going to change. It will be constant. The change in M is the area under the shear diagram. Specifically, if we look at these integrals, the change in V is the integral of negative W, and the change in M is the integral of V. If we put a little bit more detail around it, if we take a piece of our beam between x1 and x2 with some distributed load on it, the, the change in v is whatever I, the, the new value, minus whatever I started at, and the integral under there. That's the area under the load intensity diagram. The same thing here, change in m is m of x2 minus m of x1 equals the integral from x1 to x2 of v. I'm going to take the v diagram figure out how much area is underneath it, and calculate that as our change in M. Be careful with your sign conventions. These have to be followed so that you have W is positive down. That's because we usually use gravitational loads. And V, N, and M are as shown here. This is the left-hand side of the beam so that X comes from the left. Be careful here with your signs too. Because of this sign convention where W is positive down, this has a negative sign in front of the integral. So where do these graphs start? If I know how they start at the left-hand end, I know what to do with them. If we take a generic beam and look at what our point loads are at the left-hand end, here's a, a little slice of the beam, a very small x, very close to the end. And then as I take x equals zero, I'll know where my graphs start. So here are my internal loads put on here. If I do the equilibrium of this, what I get is v equals ay, n equals ax, and m is ay times x, this little distance, plus m. Of course, as x goes to zero, this goes away. So all I have is these graphs start at the point loads at the left-hand end. Specifically, v will start positive when a is, ay is up. v will start negative when ay is down. n will start positive a if ax is to the left. Remember that that balances this n. We are assuming our beam is in tension for positive numbers. And m is positive if am is like this. And if you look at this little bit of a beam, you can see that when these, both of these moments go like this, you'll have it bending into a positive thing. So that will be when your graph starts positive. What happens to our graphs when we get to point forces and point moments? If we look at a point force, here's a beam with one load in the middle, just a point force in the middle. I want to take a slice right before it and right after it and see how it changed. Here are my internal loads. Right before and right after, I get V equals A, and V equals A minus P. So what you can conclude is the change in V is going to be negative P, specifically. Here's your rule. Point force down, V goes down. Point force up, V goes up. Once I have this, I can look at my graph and say, my V diagram from wherever it is right now will drop by P precipitously right there. Note that your bending moment isn't going to change.
What happens to your graphs with a point moment? Same thing. A little bit of a beam, a little bit cut right before it, a little cut right after it. Here I get V equals A, M equals AX, whatever A is. There could be other parts of A on the left-hand side. I don't really care. But what's going on here is that as I get right past here, if you take the sum of the moments on this little slice of a beam, you have M equals AX minus Q. So the change in M has been minus Q. The point moment counterclockwise, M goes down. Here we go. Point moment clockwise, M goes up. And to sort of help you remember this, the mnemonic is that this, this counterclockwise, that's a sort of a negative connotation. If you're doing something counterculture, um, your M is going to go down. Your shear diagram does not change here. This one is unchanged. So a point moment affects the moment diagram, a point shear affects the shear diagram. Of course, the biggest thing you're going to have to do is figure out how to do these by example. And the more of these that you do, the better off you're going to be. So you need a lot of practice with this, because it's just a bunch of rules to figure out. Here is a beam that we can sort of look at. I did my equations of equilibrium, so I get Ay is 12 newtons down, Ma is 648 newton meters, and this is counterclockwise. So, at x equals 0, I'm going to start at these loads. 12 newtons down, V starts at negative 12 newtons. 648 newton meters counterclockwise, M starts at negative 648. If these had been in the other direction, then they start positive. Now we're going to just simply march along this beam as we go. Between x equals 0 and x equals 6, nothing changes. So nothing changes, V stays constant. At x equals 6, I get a point jump of 36 newtons. If I was at negative 12 and I jumped by 36, I'm now at positive 24. So here's my positive 24. Between here and here, nothing changes. V is constant. The point moment does not affect my V diagram, so nothing changes. Between 14 and 24, Right here, nothing changes, so V is constant. Now I have this distributed load. V is going to change by the area under this load intensity diagram. That area is 2 times 12. So this is going to go from 24 to a value 24 lower than that. Well, 24 minus 24 is 0. So I'm going to come back to 0. The value of W is the slope of V. Let me say that again. The value of W is the slope of V. So if I have a, neg a 2, a constant load here, I have a negative 2 actual slope here. Now remember to uh, label your diagrams as you're going along. When I want to do the moment diagram, I have to remember two different things. I have to remember this point moment, and I have to figure out what these areas are. So I've already started at negative 648. The area under this diagram is minus 72. It's 72 under the axis. Under the axis means M is going to decrease by 72. So you take 648 and you subtract 72, you get minus 720. This slope, minus 12, is the value of V. The value of V is the slope of M. That's what that integral means. Now, between the next, in the next integral, I have 192 as the area under the V-curve. That's above the axis. So I'm going to increase 720. Minus 720 plus 192 gives me minus 528. Again, this slope is the value of V. Don't forget the point moment. Point moment I have here is clockwise. M is going to have a jump of that value. So minus 528 plus 144 is minus 384. This just goes straight up. Nothing changes here. M changes here. In this next piece, I'm going to have another increase. Minus 384 to minus 144. That's your 240 right here. And then this, even though V is decreasing, the area is above the axis. So M is going to be increasing. 144 is going to be my change. If I'm at negative 144 and I add 144, I get back to zero. This is decreasing, so this is concave down. If this had been increasing, this would be concave up. 
And as you've got it, you've got a sort of situation where you're going to end up at zero. Last thing is to check the values at the end. If I look right here at a tiny little sliver very close to the end of this beam, I have no V and I have no M. So both V and M are going to end up at zero. If I had had a point load at the end, these graphs would end up at that point load. So that's my graphical construction. There are a lot of little, little nitpicky rules here. There's lists of them. You can look up the lists. But the best thing you can do right now is work a whole bunch of these so you see how these get put together. Thanks.